My name is Jane Doe. Some people say I'd rather get flowers while I live rather than after I die. Well, in my life, I received many flowers. You see, when I met my boyfriend, he was so kind and very charming. Our first date, he gave me a dozen of roses. They were beautiful. I never received roses or flowers from anyone. Our love was different from average people. He loved me differently. In fact, he would not let a day go by without me by his side. We moved together so he had me near his side every day, every hour, every minute, and every second. Every day since our first date, he gave me roses because he knew how much I loved them and they would brighten up my day. We kissed and celebrated our love. As the days went by, I was getting to know him more and more. He started unveiling to me who he really was. He showered me with gifts and roses when we had disagreements. He knew I loved roses and how much it would brighten up my day. He brought every piece of garment in my closet. Hide and seek was one of my favorite childhood games. I didn't know he still wanted me to play as an adult. He hides and secludes me from my family and my friends. He threatens me not to tell anyone. Then he gives me roses, tells me he loves me, so I stay. He brought me all of my makeup. Purple was one of his favorite colors he loved for me to wear on my eyelids. I didn't like it on me, but he did, so I wore it often. Then he gives me roses, told me he loves me, so I stay. My favorite lip color is nude. He likes me wearing red, so I wear it frequently. Then he gives me roses, told me he loved me, so I'd stay. Tattoos, I'm not a fan of them, but he likes them. He makes sure I wear them all over my body. Never had them until I met him. Then he gives me roses, tells me he loves me, so I stay. He loves for me to wear pearls around my neck. Well, his kind of pearls. I hate them because they hurt my neck. He puts them on me. Then he gives me roses tells me he loves me, so I stay. At times, he must think I have talent as a stunt woman because he punches all over my body. When I was a little girl, I always wanted my ears pierced. I have piercings all over my body, and I won't have to go to a shop to get them. He does them. He customizes them with sharp objects such as ink pens, knives, or whatever he can grab immediately. One day, I got two teeth removed out of my mouth. I didn't know he was a dentist in his own kind of way. Then he gives me roses, tells me he loves me, so I stay. I got a facelift today. I didn't know he was a skilled surgeon. After he finished with me, I couldn't recognize my birth face. He says he's sorry. Then he gives me roses. Tells me he loves me. So I stay. I guess you're wondering why I stay. Because he says he's sorry. He won't do it again. Then he gives me roses. Tells me he loves me. So I stay. On one of our anniversary dates, 
He gave me a head and back massage. I thought massages were supposed to relax you and ease some pain. But his kind of massage gave me broken ribs, injured spine, and a fractured skull. He sent me roses to the hospital and a car saying, I love you, but I couldn't stay. You see, that day was different. That was the last time he gave me roses. In fact, everyone gave me roses at my funeral. I get abused every day. Maybe I should have told someone. Maybe I should have gotten the strength and courage to leave. Maybe I should have gotten help or perhaps reached out to someone. I was screaming for help on the inside, but too afraid to tell someone who may have been able to save my life. Too late. I am John Doe. I met who I thought was the one. I was physically attracted to her. I saw many red flags. After getting to know her, she wasn't a sweet, loving person when we first met. She hits on me. When I try to walk away, she uses what hurts me the most by threatening me with it and then tries to make it up to me by giving me her roses in her special kind of way. I give in. I receive her roses and I stay. She gives me a few unwanted tattoos. I'm not very fond of exposing them to people because people would see me as weak if they knew. So I hide them. I really want to leave, but every time I try to walk away, she hits on me and uses what hurt me the most by threatening me with it. And then she gives me her roses in her special kind of way. I give in. I receive her roses, so I stay. When we get into arguments, she redesigns my clothes by violently grabbing, pulling, and ripping. But every time I try to walk away, she uses what hurts me the most by threatening me with it. And then she gives me her roses in her special kind of way. I give in. I receive her roses. So I stay. At times when she doesn't get her way, she rearranges the entire house. She also vandalizes my But every time I try to walk away, she hits on me and uses what hurts me the most by threatening me with it and then give me her roses in her special kind of way. I give in. I receive her roses. So I stay. It's hard making eye contact with the opposite sex because of her insecurities. She attacks me verbally and emotionally. Then she gets physical, slapping, punching, hitting, and biting. I really want to leave. Yo, where you go? Where you go? You ain't about to go I'm nowhere. Leaving. No, you ain't going nowhere. I don't see you for anything. I'm gonna take your stuff. I'm gonna take your children. What? I ain't doing nothing. What? But every time I try to walk away, she uses what hurts me the most by threatening me with it. And then she give me her roses in her special kind of way. I give in. I receive her roses. So I stay. Let me introduce myself. My name is John Doe. I get abused daily. I know it's not popular to hear that men get abused by a woman because no one talks about it. And most of us men don't tell because we don't want to be labeled as we People only talk about women. But what about us? 
I mean, we need respect too. Domestic violence is not a one-sided issue. We are screaming for help on the inside, but no one hears us. One day, the roses wilt. She hit me the last time. I tried to leave. But her heightened emotion made her attack me, hitting me in the back of my head with a metal bat. Then I felt as if I was floating in the air. I looked down and saw a lady dressed in all black placing long stem roses on my grave. The lady I saw was my weeping mother. I am another victim of domestic violence. My relationship was great at the beginning. I never saw this coming because he was so loving, such a gentleman, and he was so romantic. He showered me with dozens of roses and chocolate candy every day. It didn't have to be a holiday for me to get them. My man says he loves me. Every night, he places a long stem rose on my pillow. Now there's no more chocolate, no more sincere kisses, no more real hugs, but only real hard punches. However, I still receive many roses after heated arguments and fights, of course. Then he tells me he loves me. He places a long stem rose on my pillow. That's why I stay. Our relationship stays private. He makes sure of that. So he secludes me from everyone, even my family. He should have been into the performing arts because he likes to make a scene at my place of employment. And when I get home, he punches on me, tells me he wants me to himself, threatens me, so I quit my job. And when I get home, he yells, screams and beats on me. He places a long stem rose on my pillow. That's why I stay. He acts like a psychiatrist because he gets in my mind playing emotional mind games with me, never allowing me to think for myself. When I don't respond the way he expects me to, he yells, screams, and beats on me, threatens me, and then kisses me on my forehead, tell me he loves me. And so I stay. I later found out that he was a skilled chiropractor <laughs> in his own kind of way. He broke three of my fingers last night. He told me to lie about my injuries. He so-called made it up to me by placing a long stem rose on my pillow, so I stayed. The other day, 
he made me wear some homemade body oil. I didn't like it. it burns my skin. He didn't care. He was so mad. He poured that hot grease all over my body. He told me to lie and say I was cooking fried chicken and the grease spilled on me. He got so angry. He threatened to kill me and my family. I was so afraid. Then he placed a long stem rose on my pillow. So I stayed. One day, he got so angry, he choked me. I couldn't breathe. I almost passed out. He threatened me not to tell anyone. Then he placed a long stem rose on my pillow. But I had enough. I told him I wanted to leave. But he threatened to kill me if I left. And my loved ones. Then he placed another long stem rose on my pillow. I was so afraid for my life and my loved ones. That's why I stay. Guess what? I got a tan last night. Not by my choice. He threw gasoline all over my body. He said he wanted me to light up like a Christmas tree. told me not to tell anyone. He also threatened to kill me if I told anyone. He said he was sorry. He started crying and said he would get help. He put a dozen of roses in my hand. kissed me on my forehead and told me he loved me. That's not love. And so I didn't stay. I had to make sure that was the last time he gave me roses and bruises. Because I got the strength to leave. I left, <laughs> and I didn't look back. I went to the store today. Guess what I brought? I brought myself a dozen of red roses because I'm celebrating my life as a survivor. Roses aren't bad. They are a traditional symbol for love. And love is an action, not a reaction. So, if someone gives you red roses or say they love you, Make sure you see it through their actions. Roses are beautiful if you receive them out of love. I'd rather get roses while I can smell them rather than after I die. Well, I've lived to smell my roses. I am alive. I am a survivor. And I'm sharing my story to help end the silence on domestic violence. 
I thank God for allowing me another day to smell roses. I'm an abuser. Being an abuser wasn't a learned behavior for me. It is an unresolved pain from my past that has gotten out of control. I may not look like an abuser physically, but get to know me. At first, I may seem very charming and loving. I act charming in order to extract your weaknesses and use them against you to hurt you. Here's a little about my emotional struggles. I was raised in a domestic violence atmosphere. I became a product of my own environment. I watched my father fight my mother. And when he wasn't around, she took her anger out on me, hitting, slapping, and punching me. I was abused emotionally and physically my entire childhood. Part of my emotional abuse was a lack of being loved and cared for properly. The abuse trickled down to me by watching the actions of these abusers. As they say, hurt people, hurt people. Therefore, I became an abuser myself. Now as an adult, I have unhealthy relationships. So if you do love me, I will push you away by becoming aggressive and controlling because I am so afraid of losing you. For an example, I will play mind games with you. I will abuse you emotionally and physically and make you think my abuse is normal. <laughs> I will make you question your sanity, making you feel like your issues are your mental problems rather than the issue itself, me, the abuser. I plead to you making you believe I'm generally sorry. This behavior keeps you in this abusive dynamic and I maintain the position of power and control over you. I take note of your vulnerability and use it against you. When I abuse you, I like to make you feel that you are the one that's insane. When I don't get my way through my manipulation, I feel hurt, angry, oppressed, unable to defend myself. My anger becomes more intense and then I get extremely physical. So I react to these issues by becoming a bully, dominating and victimizing you. I can't stay in this hurt and emotional dark place too long. It's too damaging. It's too much for me. I have a very weak sense of self. So therefore, I make my victims pay for it. I will make you doubt yourself. I will alienate you from everyone. I never keep promises I make and I will deny the promise I make. I threaten you to make you lie to cover up the truth. I will make you stay silent about your abuse in public and will do all the talking for you. I will make you feel depressed, hopeless, and alone, making you feel like it's all your fault. I refuse to allow anyone to hurt or control me, so I take control. I have been carrying years of frustration and anger around, and I keep them hidden deep within. One tiny rejection will spark all of my emotions that is built up inside of me and cause me to react. It's hard to talk about my emotions. So I just act out on them. My temper flares up when I don't get my way. When things seem to work against me or when I feel rejected, so I find a way to release my emotions. I get physical. I'm afraid to have anything leave me. My relationships forms and moves the way I want them to be. I don't know how to express all the hurtful emotions going on inside of me what I feel, what I think, which is a great part of my frustration. I lash out by yelling, saying hurtful things, and physically interacting. This is my way of expressing the hurtful, dark, deep-rooted issues inside of me. These things come from my inability to communicate maturely and effectively. I will put a wall around my pain so the easiest thing to show is anger. I become extremely aggressive when I don't want people to see what's going on with me on the inside. The dark things that happened in my past that I'm ashamed of haunts me. If a reminder of those dark events hit that emotional nerve, the abuse comes out.
now that you know more about who I am, consider your thoughts. Sometimes the consequences of just being out a little longer than he thought was too long, he would come back to arguing, fighting, um, pushing. It would be, it wouldn't be something, a big blow up. It would be subtle. And then it would be a next time you go to the store, they'll be sitting and watching how long you're going to the store. And then they'll come back and they'll take the car for hours. So if you share a car, there's no way you can leave the house. So now he done isolated you in the house. So you can't go anywhere. Um, it would be times where uh, say like if I wash the dishes and I put the dishes in the wrong way, it would be an argument in regards to how the dishes are put in. Um, if he wanted money and we would discuss about money and he was like, well, I'm the breadwinner of this and I'm supposed to have this and I'm supposed to have that. And then it'll turn into a fight. When I was actually pregnant, we actually fought over check the checkbook because he wanted the checkbook and he we didn't have any money in the account so he wanted to kite some checks with our names on it and in result of that we he ended up fighting me while I was eight months pregnant and you know it became a thing where you didn't really want to say anything to anybody because you didn't know who was going to say something back to him and then it would have made it worse for you. And then they would also threaten your friends. They would threaten your family. And you, in your mind, you're like, well, if he did this to me, why wouldn't he do this to them? Not only that, you know, we, we fought. It wasn't a a mutual fight it was more or so him fighting and then you trying to fight back and then the fight back ended up turning into more aggressive fighting and for me it was the point where um i was out for hours i didn't even know what happened when i woke up and the downside to that was when we decided I wanted to go to the hospital and things of that nature, it was always a story. Well, you got to get your story together when, you know, the, you go to the hospital. You have to get your story together. You have to tell them that you went to a club and you got jumped. I'm like, why would I tell them that? Because that's what I told you to tell them. And it would be things of that nature. And... When we got to the hospital, he would be so close to me so that even if I wanted to whisper a word that I was abused by him, he intimidated the whole thing. After I got seen in the hospital, the nurses had already knew what happened. So I didn't even have to say a word. It was almost as though they were trained to look for things like that. And I'm thankful for that happening in the hospital. Cause if not, <laughs> I don't think I would have had the courage to tell because he was staying so close to me. The first time she hit me, I thought I was tripping. I thought I was overanalyzing things. But as she grabbed me and had her hand around my throat, I felt the pressure and as I looked in her eyes, she had rage and anger, as in if nothing had ever happened. I didn't see it at first, but the rage grew over time. People always ask me why I stayed. I stayed because I loved her. I stayed because I felt like I could change her. I stayed because I felt like there was nobody else for me. There was nobody else that would love me. As crazy as this sound, it felt like with her, I had the love that I had been searching for, and she played on that. She drove off that, and she used that to hurt me. In our relationship, it was always about control. She was a narcissist, and still is to this day. We have a child together, and my child is scared now because of her. 
the court system is double standard. The man is always accused of being in wrong. But what happens when the man needs help and can't get the help that's needed? What happens when the system fails? This woman attacked me in the courthouse. As I was seeking an order of protection, she came in and in the midst of over 20 people being there, began to assault me. There was no fear of arrest with her. She actually bragged about being arrested. So my experience was, um, he was very romantic, always buying gifts and clothes. Um, and then if he got angry, started with just name calling or um, saying hurtful things. Um, and then later he would apologize and buy gifts. Eventually the anger turned into swinging in the air, um, punching holes in the wall, but then always saying he's sorry and um, buying me, you know, luxurious gifts. Um, and people looking outside in would think, oh, this is such a great guy, how he was so caring and loving. But what they didn't see was when we were home, um, one little thing would make him become so angry um, that he would put all that anger towards me. But my breaking moment was um, a simple argument about clothes um, where he had me up against the wall. Um, again, calling me outside of my name, saying hurtful things, um, using profanity. And his fist was in the air and the anger that he had, you could see in his face, he was debating if he wanted to let his fist go um, to hit me in the face. Um, eventually he calmed down and let me go and he didn't swing but I knew at that point I had to leave that's either you're going to stay and the next time he's gonna let his fist go and hit you in the face or you're gonna walk away um, and again there was many times where he would say he was sorry he would, he would get help we actually did go to counseling at one point um, but I made the decision for me and my family that this wasn't acceptable I didn't want my children to see that um, and that it wasn't, um, it wasn't okay to go through that type of abuse, emotional or verbal. I had started making recordings of myself when we were on the phone or when we would argue or when he was in the room. I would hit record on my cell phone because I felt whenever this anger hits this level, I need somebody to know what really happened because I didn't know what he was going to do. Um, and then I had to start saying, I'm going to keep these recordings just so if someone finds my phone, they'll hear it. And then I started saying, well, what if he gets rid of the phone? So I started emailing it, and that's what, I mean, sharing it to somebody. And I let my friend, uh, my best friend at the time, hear it. And she said, this isn't normal. I would never expect um, this to come out of his mouth. So at that point, when I had my best friend who I kept it from, um, and the fact that she knows I was strong and, you know, I can be a boss from nine to five, but at home, I was under this person who controlled everything and she just, they couldn't, people didn't see how you can be that, but when you love somebody and you care about somebody and you're under their command, you, you submit. So at that point, my best friend told me this isn't normal. My best friend told me that this, you've got to do something um, on top of the fact, like I said, I made a decision where he was going to swing the next door around. So I have to get help. So I got my family around. Um, my two best friends and I finally just said, I can't do this anymore. We have to separate from over just a little bit. And at that point he said he promised he could help and he did go. But it was at that point I said, I'm not letting him come back. I, I can't. Um, and the therapist even at, well, at that point even said that, you know, he needs some help. There's some, they wouldn't tell me what, but they said there's some deep things that he needs to work on. But that was my breaking point. Just, if I can just get him off the house, I will be okay. Um, and like I said, I still was fearful. I still thought that he would come, and he did. He would show up at my job a time or two. Um, but my breaking point was, I can just go to the house. It would be a change of locks. Um, I had my family there to make sure he left. Um, and they weren't there to provoke. It was just, because I didn't tell them everything. It was just, we need to separate. I need somebody to be here while we, while he's moving a few things out. Um, and then when it was time to get all of his stuff, I wasn't there. I let somebody else be there. Um, but it's traumatic, and like I said, it's been seven, eight years later, and I'm still every now and then fearful if I see someone that looks like him, um, which is post-traumatic stress. <laughs> um, but I would still get fearful because you just don't ever know with that level of anger what might happen. When he walks up to me, will he be like, hey, how are you? I'm sorry, you know, I got some help, or will he still blame me and say it's all your fault? Um, 
um, that we did this thing together and you broke your promise. So um, maybe he's just angry about something and he chooses to take it out on me like that. So, um, who knows? But it's not normal. It's not okay. Um, and um, they need to get help. It's a misconception in today's society. Many people think that men don't suffer from domestic violence and abuse at the hands of women. Because I was unknowingly in a relationship with what is clinically called covert female narcissism. Domestic violence is not always about women. Domestic violence is something real, gender neutral. It happens to men and women. It first started with being controlling. I wasn't able to see my friends. I wasn't able to see my family. We argued a lot because I wanted to see my family and friends. That was the arguments all the time. I would argue with him when we come home until the time we go to bed. And then it got physical. And it scared me so bad, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have nowhere to turn, no one to talk to. I was in it alone. I felt alone. And then it became worse. I was scared to leave. I was afraid that if I leave, that he would find me. He was always able to. But then, the writing was on the wall, I knew I had to leave. So I knew that in leaving, that it would work, that I knew I would be free. So I got up and left, and I packed my things, and I left. And for a while, I was scared. I was looking over my shoulder, wondering if he was going to walk up on me and hurt me. As time went on, that didn't happen, and I was free. It was hard for me to move ahead because he belittled me so much, and to hear him tell me that I wasn't going to be anything, I wasn't going to amount to anything, I believed it. And it was very hard for me to move on because that's all that I kept hearing in my head, that I was nothing. When we argued, he was stoned out by mentally abusing me. And the more angry he got, the more physical he became. He would grab me, he would shake me. One time he punched me, another time he choked me. And then after that, he would want to make up. And when I didn't, he would hit me again. He wanted to make up by having sex. I wasn't in the mood, but I was scared that if I didn't, that he would hit me again. So I went through the motions just to please him. I would count the seconds until he was done. And then he said he loved me. He said he was sorry. He said he would never do it again. And then he would go to sleep. He had put his hands on me for the last time. And I went to work the following morning. And enough was enough. I knew he was gone to work. I came back to our place. I packed all of my things, and I left. I was so scared, but I've had enough, and I just left. After I left, he found me at a location and was trying to make up with me. I couldn't do it. I couldn't see myself going back. And he told me that he would change. I stopped believing him. 
and he was angry and I got so, so scared, but he didn't do anything. He left and it was very hard for me, but as time went on, I got stronger. The thought in my mind was that I was free. And the more I thought about that, the happier I was. I was at peace that I was free, that I survived. As a survivor of domestic violence, you learn the signs and things that you never realized before. One of the signs I've seen is isolation. Another sign is financial. They will take money, hide money. Um, they will say, hey, you don't have to work. And then they will make you financially dependent on them. So where if you wanted to leave, there's no way you could because you didn't have any money to leave. Uh, as far as isolation, it would start subtly. It would be like, um, your mom calls too much, or your sister is always calling, or your friends are always calling. And then because you love them, you decide, hey, maybe they do call too much. So you scale back on calling them and different things like that. So you start isolating yourself. Um, another way they, another sign I had seen was, you know, spiritual abuse. Because you like going to church, they find an issue with you going to church. Why are you going to church so much? Why have you been going to church for so long? And is somebody at church that you like, maybe you need to stay home instead of going to church. So they'll use different things uh, to manipulate you into the relationship to stay isolated with them and them only. Tom, he would always um, clock me how long I was gone for and different things like that so you know it wasn't it was financial too because you know he would have a he didn't have a job so for me it was I was the one who was making the money but he was like well I need this and I'm like well we don't have it he was like well you're going to give it to me and then we'll end up fighting over money and stuff like that too so some signs to um, look out for are the quick ang quick to anger, um, little things. If they've had a bad day at work and they come home and you say something that normally wouldn't upset them, but this particular time um, it did, and it's not a normal like get upset, but normal where it blows out of proportion. Um, when you can't control your anger, when they follow you, when they want don't want you to have your own life or your own time, um, or they make you feel guilty if you um, do something without them, um, when they become suspicious so much. Um, when um, things that you say and confident on are, um, you know, when they talk about the, the pillow talk, and then when they're angry, they turn around and throw it in your face. Um, when first it starts with just uh, pinches or pulling, and then it becomes shoving, and then it becomes actually hitting um, holes in the wall, swinging in the air, that's not normal. That's someone who can't control their anger, and they're acting out almost like a temper tantrum. Um, so my signs, and again, there were red signs all along at the beginning, but I thought it was cute. You know, he'd get mad, angry, and slip up and call me out of my name, but then the next day I got a coach back, and it's, I'm sorry, baby, or well, I get flowers into the job. And so you, you say, oh, it was just an accident, or it was just that one time. But that one time becomes, starts to become the pattern. Um, to the point where you know, and then they cry, I didn't mean it, I'm going to get help, but they never really do. Um, so, some signs I would definitely say things that they're quick to anger. Um, if it's repeated patterns, calling out of your name, taking things that you give them out of confidence, taking things, if you say this really hurt me and I want to tell you about it, a childhood story, um, a current event that happened, and then they take and throw it in your face because they want to hurt you, and then they apologize later. Those, those are all signs of, um, verbal abuse, um, and then physical abuse, like I said, just starts with little things, you know, or I was angry, so you bumped into me, but well, the next time it's, you know, a punch, or I was just choking when I was choking you, um, I thought you would like, you know, it's all different types of stuff for different people, but it's not normal, and if your inner being is saying this isn't right, you should trust your inner tuition that it's not right. The signs is being controlling. 
not being able to think for myself, not being able to see my friends when I want it, not being able to spend time with my family when I want it. At first, I didn't pay too much attention, but as over time, the controllingness, the jealousy, the accusations of me always cheating grew harder and harder to escape. The thought of when I went to sleep, what she would do to me, took me to that point. My breaking point was when she told me that she could kill me and get away with it. And as I looked her eyes and she said those words, it scared the shit out of me. And I realized I got to get away. I saw the red flags. I overlooked them. I didn't want to believe it. I felt that I could change her. I felt that the love that we had could overcome everything. I was wrong. There are never any red flags at the beginning. The part of the cycle of that abuse is the what they call the idealization stage where she did a lot of idealizing me, mirroring me. Whatever I like, she liked. There were no disagreements. There was no but no signs whatsoever. Everything that I liked, she liked. The music I liked, she liked. The places I liked to go. So in actuality, I was really attracted and I fell in love with myself because she just reflected back to me the things that she thought I wanted to see. So there are no red flags in this particular dynamic of narcissistic domestic abuse. Everything seems like this is your soulmate. She even used that term that we were soulmates and we had everything in common and we were put together and God put us together. And because I had known her a very long time outside of being in a relationship, I know her as a friend, which I thought I did. But the closer I got and the more time went on, that dynamic terribly changed and it was horrible. But in the beginning, there are never any red flags when you deal with these type of individuals. It only comes once they know they've got you hooked and they know that you are interested in them and in love with them. That's when the abuse begins and you go into cognitive dissonance because you cannot understand why you would love someone that's abusing you and it's very hard to escape. Once the relationship progresses and she knew that she had me, she knew that I very much was in love with her and I was doing anything and everything I could do to please her. But when you're dealing with this type of abuse, there's nothing that you can ever do to please an abuser. Because see, the abuse is not just physical abuse, it's psychological, emotional, um, verbal, a lot of verbal abuse, a lot of cursing. No matter what I did, it was never enough. No matter where we lived, she wanted something else. So you go out of your way because they keep moving the goalposts. They say, okay, get this and then we'll be good. And you go out of your way and get that. And then she would always want something else. And so now you're just always chasing this individual. I was chasing her approval, but never getting anything back. And always being made to feel like I could do better and I could do more and I was never enough. And because you're in love with this person, and now this person is controlling you. That's where the psychological abuse comes in. That gnaws away at your self-esteem because it's this person that you're chasing so hard to please, they're not giving you anything back. But because you're in love with them, you're trying to subconsciously prove to them that you're lovable, that they should be loving you back and you're chasing that love and that is emotional abuse. And for many, many years I dealt with that and it gnaws away and it kills your self-esteem, it kills your self-respect so you get to the point where you don't even recognize yourself. And now your whole existence is trying to please this person and trying to show this person that you are worthy of their love, worthy of their attention. It was abuse, emotional, psychological abuse, and it would progress, but there would be moments of physical abuse. Those days were sure to come, and they did. If you're in a relationship and you feel like you're the only one doing the giving. You feel like there's no reciprocation of anything that you do. You feel like that you're not being appreciated. When you're spoken to and you feel like you're being demeaned. When you have a conversation that can just turn into an argument within a split second out of nowhere and you're trying to explain yourself and that person is saying that they didn't say things that you know that they said. When that person 
is blame shifting and bringing up things from the past two weeks ago, two, two days ago, two years ago. That's abuse. When you find yourself in go nowhere conversations that turn into arguments just out of nowhere and the arguments could last for three, four hours. When you see these signs and someone is hitting you and you're a man and it's a female and she's hitting you because she's angry over a misunderstanding that immediately exploded into an argument that she initiated, that's abuse and you have to get out of that. I had to hold up a certain image when we go out. I couldn't be myself. I had to be a certain way when we go out. And it wasn't my natural self. If you know someone or you are a friend to someone, I would say encourage, keep encouraging and uplifting your friends. Never leave their side. Um, sometimes the actions of the friends and the family can be just as damaging as the abuser. So you want to be careful in what you're saying and how you're saying it. You want to be supportive. Um, I know it can be frustrating, but to encourage someone to keep going and keep fighting, you just have to let them know that they are strong and God did not forget about them and that he is with them every step of the way. Um, at the end of the day, it's about strength and you have to keep drilling in their head how strong they are how proud of them they are making the decision to want to leave. Uh, never become negative, never become demeaning to them because you'll feel the same as the relationship they're in. So they're going to want to stay in the relationship. They're not going to want to leave. So that's advice I would say as a friend. Just be encouraging, support and love on them. Call on them, check on them. Stop by sometimes out the blue just to see if they look okay. good. There's nothing wrong with getting help. There's nothing wrong with seeking therapy. There's nothing wrong with talking with someone because your feelings have become manipulated. So you need to learn how to unpack everything that has happened to you so you won't carry it through life. Um, you had to know how to um, decipher between anger, sadness, happiness, because all those emotions get jumbled up in one emotion at a time. And when you don't understand how they operate, you'll consider yourself mad when you're not really mad, you could be sad. So seeking therapy is one way. Um, so therapy is a good way to help you while you're in and while you're leaving. Um, because it'll actually give you more strength to keep going. Um, it'll also help you with future relationships. Not just relationships in the manner of um, sexual or um, that type of relationship. It'll help you with friendships. It'll help you in trusting not just other people but yourself as well. Um, because as a survivor, you just don't know who to trust. You, your mind is play. It's almost like your mind is playing tricks on you. So that's why therapy is very, very important. Not only that, if you have children, have therapy with them as well and separately, so they can feel comfortable telling how they felt during this whole time that the abuse was going on. So they will know how to manage their emotions and things like that as well. I really wish when I went through, there were a lot of the resources then that they have now because it was so scary doing it by yourself and you didn't know what to do, who to turn to, where to go. I mean, it was me and a baby. It's like, who, how are you gonna get through this by yourself? You're traveling by yourself, you have absolutely nothing. So you're just, it's like you're starting from fresh. And I just wish they had the resources and 
they're actually talking more about domestic violence and they're putting more of a face to it. And I just wish that was the opportunity I had when I was coming, going through. Now that it's out there, we can help other women that are going through so they won't feel so alone, so afraid, and feel like that nobody cares or hears their voices. You got to love yourself. You have to know that you deserve better. And know you don't deserve to be hurt, in pain, hit, abused. No one deserves that. Take control. Know your true work. Know that it's okay to start over. Know that it's okay to be alone. Know that you are loved and that there's someone else that can love you without the abuse and pain. It's okay. It's okay to walk away. Walking away is not being a coward, is not being afraid, but is doing what's right for you. To get out of an abusive relationship, and I speak from a man's perspective, you have to implore self-preservation. You have to think about yourself. If you're in a situation, you have children, you have to think about your, and you have to understand that as hard as it is to walk away from a situation like this, because usually when you're abused and you've been dealing with this abuse, it's because you love this person. The love that you have for this person and the attachment emotionally that this person used to bring you in in the beginning is what is going to make you stuck and you're going to stay there and you're going to try to rationalize the behavior and you're going to say to yourself well maybe it's not that bad and you're going to say well i need to be here for my children but if you're not a whole person and the person is abusing you you're not going to be any good for your children and your children are going to see you deteriorate and they're going to absorb and learn that abuse and that negative environment and that dysfunctional environment will become normal for them so you have to make a decision to get out the hardest thing that I ever had to do was walk away and leave a woman that I love very much because loving her was killing me and I had to go. You have to go and you have to get out and you have to get out quickly. Whatever, whatever you have to do to make it happen, you can make it happen. But you have to get out of this before it destroys you because it destroys you moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. And you look up and years will go by and you won't recognize yourself. You will lose yourself trying to please that abuser. You will lose yourself as a man trying to give someone something that can never be pleased. You have to get out. You have to get out because this type of person in a domestic narcissist relationship, this person, they will never hear you and they will never take any accountability for any of their actions. And no matter what happened, everything will be your fault. You'll never get an apology. They will never say, I'm sorry. And if they do, they'll say that they're sorry that you feel that way. They're sorry that you caused them to do whatever they did, but there will never be any self-reflection, any self-accountability. And when you find this, you are being abused. That is psychological, emotional, and verbal abuse. When you find yourself in a situation like this, you've got to get out of it before it destroys you from the inside out. It destroys your mind. It destroys your sanity. It destroys the way you feel as a man and it will make you feel like you are worth less than two pennies. When you find these things happening, you have to find a way to exit that relationship immediately. After 15 years of psychological, emotional, verbal, and physical abuse, after all these years of all the name calling, all the degrading comments, all the bad words about my family, all the hitting during arguments, and all the silent treatment, not valuing me, not valuing anything that I contributed to the relationship. The final straw for me, we had an argument about 10 o'clock at night, your usual argument with the cursing and the back and forth. I shut my bedroom door and I said, I'm going to bed, leave me alone. Only to wake up at midnight with my room door opening and I'm in the dead of my sleep and I see three silhouettes standing over me and there were three police officers just standing over me and I thought I was dreaming and it shook me out of my sleep and it traumatized me. They said that the woman that I was with at the time said that I kicked her and the police were called out. This was a bold faced lie. They made me get out of bed. They handcuffed me. However, I'd never threatened her at any time. And I stood there for 30 minutes while they determined if I was going to go to jail or not. With my children out in the next room, knowing that the police were in my room, I was humiliated. I felt 
as though I was a man and with the tension between African American men and the police in our society, I could have lost my life in that bedroom. I was not jailed that night because I didn't do anything. I was able to get out of the handcuffs, they let me go back to bed. But the next morning I was troubled all day and I knew if I didn't get out of that situation that I was going to die. Those police officers could have killed me and even till today I wake up and I have nightmares of that moment. It devastated me. It was then I knew that I had to go. One way you could get out is do it subtly. I wouldn't say do it all at once. Do piece by piece. Don't make it obvious. Make sure you have a backup plan. Make sure you trust the people that you are trying to, um, are utilizing you to help you get away. Because one thing about trying to get out of a domestic violence is if somebody mentioned to him that you're leaving. Never leave a clue that you're leaving. And then once you get out, stay out. Don't come back. I had, to be honest, I did go back. And that was because, you know, again, it was a thing of, oh, I've changed. Um, I went to counseling, I did this and I did that. But at the end of the day, they don't change. They just change it. Like they say, leopards don't change their spots. All they do is change how they do it this time. It's never going to be the same way as the last time. Um, I also want to say, um, getting out is something that takes planning. Utilize the domestic violence hotlines and the different shelters that they have out there for women to allow you to make it in the process of you going to your next phase in life. Holding my head again Making my way through crowded thoughts Sometimes it's hard to get out of it Broke my heart in the dark I was just trying to feel something Falling asleep to the sound of it Always used to let you clean up the mess Just down on my knees Thought I couldn't stand up on my own Turns out sometimes you're stronger alone Bringing out the fight, yeah, bring on all the lightning Cause I'm looking for a hero Look inside the mirror I find one, oh Carry the hurt when it gets too hard Pick it up, dust it off When I fall down 11, I get up 12 Don't need nobody else Yeah, I can save myself Got burned, but I learned Our scars make us who we are Now I'm 10 feet tall over my demons Remind me no one's got me like myself yeah, I love me without any help I'm the best thing to believe in So I'm bringing out the fight, yeah Bring on all the lightning Cause I'm looking for a hero Look inside the mirror I find one, oh Carry the hurt when it gets too hard Pick it up, dust it off When I fall down a As heavy as a season And the sun is always right behind the storm Bringing out the fight, yeah Bring on all the lightning Cause I'm looking for a hero Look inside the mirror I find one, oh Carry the hurt when it gets too hard Pick it up, dust it off